chalk it up to another win for the Contrarians. Who would have thought there would have been so little contention over the results of last week's election? I think if you polled people, more than half would have said this is going to take weeks to sort out. There will be lawsuits. And sure enough, believe it or not, this seems resolved more or less. A week later, hello and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name's Adrian Pocabelli. So almost a new world dawns ahead of us. Whichever side of the outcome you were rooting for, a new political reality beckons. So it'll be interesting to see how it impacts us in the natural resources beat, because many of these trends, you know, these big themes have been developing over several presidential terms. You know, I think it was Stephen Lieb back in 2010 who wrote the book Red Alert, warning of resource scarcity way ahead of the crowd. Unfortunately, in the financial business, one could argue there's not much of a huge difference between being early and being wrong. So timing is everything when it comes to at least the investment side of things. But overall, In terms of foresight, we could say Stephen Lieb was right. We are in a world where all of a sudden governments are, for lack of better terms, scrambling to identify and accumulate, you know, natural resources. Because, of course, the connection, as I said, you know, it wasn't really made 10 years ago in the West between the supply chain and, frankly, the economy. I dare say this is a product of COVID, one could argue. I'll never forget the first stories we started seeing of car companies investing in mines. I mean, that was a paradigm shift. And when did that happen? That was around 2021, 2022, to speak generally. There may have been exceptions to that. Totally possible. But as a theme, as a narrative trend, that was basically after COVID occurred. So now, of course, Trump, as I was mentioning last week, is pretty pro-mining. But look at Biden. He doubled down. I mean, one could argue Biden was the biggest, you know, supporter, quote unquote, of all, interestingly. So it's become a bipartisan issue, which, again, I would say looking back 10 years ago, it wasn't really the left really wasn't on side. It was still seen as a dirty, dangerous, ultimately polluting industry. Interestingly, among the general population, this narrative transformation is still occurring, but at least among policymakers, generally speaking, increasingly, almost day by day, this narrative has done a 180, as we saw in the nuclear energy industry. I mean, it's incredible. We are seeing a similar narrative cycle, narrative phenomenon, narrative structure, dare I say. So I think the big question mark over here that I have is, Weirdly, will Trump be as aggressive as Biden on securing natural resources? I mean, this is how much things have changed. That's my genuine question. Will he be as aggressive? Because as we're seeing at the end of Biden's term, with the approval of these lithium mines, you know, waiting for this visit to Angola for the Libido Corridor, with all of the statements from Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State, We are seeing this is right near the top of the agenda, because, of course, as we've seen with all the wars, particularly in the last five years, mining natural resources are playing a larger and larger role in geopolitical decision making. I mean, it's a striking thing. Now, as I've always said here, it's always been a part of geopolitics, but now when there is a sense of scarcity, and let's qualify what we mean by scarcity. It depends on the metal you're talking about. You know, let's say, you know, copper, there is a sense of scarcity. Other metals like lithium or even graphite or even rare earths, there's not necessarily the same sense that there isn't enough metal out there. The bigger concern, to qualify our point, is that a good deal of the processing is being done in China. And with copper, you could see this being double trouble. Because, of course, we have a scarcity of the metal, potentially, as we stare down a potential dwindling of supply and of grades, while China continues to maintain 
a significant portion of the refining of copper. You know, so a lot to consider here as we digest the results of last week's mega election in the U.S. You know, my spider sense, I wonder to myself, like, is there another shoe to drop here? Has this story truly resolved? I have to say my spider sense is saying this was too simple of a story. So as you probably heard, if you are paying attention to the mining news, we had a huge story out of Mali. Again, last time it was Barrick Gold, this time it's Resolute Mining. And just to bring you up to speed on Barrick Gold for background, because I think it's quite relevant here, let's call it five weeks ago, four Barrick Gold employees from the Lulo Gunkoto mine in Mali were arrested for, to paraphrase, financial crimes, basically evading, you know, paying the authorities what they were alleged, you know, supposed to have paid. And then we saw the story that appeared last episode, which seemed to suggest that Barrick had paid $85 million, you know, as part of the negotiations that began last month. And the four employees were released. So nowhere was it written that the $85 million was, you know, basically ransomed for the four employees. But it's pretty tempting to make a link there. And here we have this headline, you know, five, six weeks later, Resolute Mining CEO Executives Detained in Mali, Bloomberg News via Mining.com. So this story came out November 9th, you know, what I would say on the heels of this Barrick story, which we led the show with. So let's get some details here before we start making more speculative conclusions here. Let's see what it says. Terry Hollihan, chief executive officer of Australian gold miner Resolute Mining, has been detained by the military-controlled government of Mali in West Africa, the company said. So today is November 12th. We have no news that they were released. Okay, so they've been detained now for three or four days. It continues. Hollihan and two other company executives had traveled to Bamako, the nation's capital, to hold discussions with local mining and tax authorities, but were, quote, unexpectedly detained, end quote, by government officials after the meetings concluded on Friday, Resolute said on Sunday. Now, I have to say, if I was Resolute Mining, I'd be getting on the phone with Mark Brisso and asking for advice and finding out exactly what happened there, you know, over a little over a month ago in Mali with the four employees and get some guidance because now it's been a few days. Let's continue. The apparent detention, and well written here by Bloomberg, the apparent detention follows a number of arrests in recent weeks targeting fellow gold miner Barrick Gold employees by the military government, which staged a coup d'etat in 2020. Four Barrick Gold employees were arrested in October. Resolute and other international miners have been under growing pressure since the military seized power as Mali seeks to boost revenue from its mineral resources through a mining code adopted last year. And don't forget, from the stories we've read in the last few weeks, Mark Brisso and Barrick had offered Mali 55% to 45% of the Lulo Gunkoto complex, from my understanding, and the Mali government said no. 55% is not enough for us, incredibly. And we have a quote from the company, quote, Resolute has followed all official processes with respect to its affairs and has provided the authorities with detailed responses to all the claims made, end quote. The company said, quote, while Resolute is working towards a settlement with the government of Mali to help secure the long-term future of the Siama gold mine, the utmost priority remains the safety and well-being of its employees, end quote. A Mali mining official previously declined to comment when reached by phone. So that's November 9th. Now, moving up to November 11th, we have another story from Bloomberg News via mining.com. Resolute CEO detention in Mali comes amid West Africa mining squeeze. Gold miner Resolute Mining finds itself at the center of a broad shakeup of regulatory regimes across West Africa following the detention of the company's chief executive in Mali as cash-strapped governments seek to generate more revenue from their natural resources. Mali's military junta, crippled by sanctions and cut off from Western aid, is at the forefront of the push, aggressively pursuing both Resolute and Canadian giant Barrick Gold, which has also had its employees detained and a key license threatened in recent months. But neighboring Niger, 
Burkina Faso, Senegal, and Ivory Coast are also updating mining codes, stripping permits, or launching sector-wide audits. And we have a quote from Chris Eager, Resolute's chief financial officer, who said on an earnings call last month, quote, We're seeing it across Africa, especially in West Africa. It's unfortunately the environment that we're living in. As we're generating a lot more cash because of the gold price environment, one of the, I think, unfortunate byproducts of it is that people are looking for possibly a bigger piece of the pie, end quote. The moves have come as gold has soared. The precious metal has risen about 30% this year and reached an all-time high of $2,790.10 per ounce amid mounting geopolitical uncertainty in the run-up to Donald Trump's U.S. election victory. The detention of Resolute boss Terry Hollihan follows Malley's audit of the mining industry and the adoption of new legislation for the sector that raises the state's share in mining projects. And just a couple of more lines here. Next door, Niger's military government has blocked France's Orano SA from exporting uranium ore, which contributed to a breakneck rally in the minerals price following the ban. Meanwhile, Burkina Faso changed its mining code last year to ratchet up the state's royalty share. Ivory Coast is changing its tax regime, and Senegal's new government is conducting an audit of the mining sector dating back to 2017. While Resolute shares plummeted by a third on Monday, other mining companies active in Mali also suffered. Kodal Minerals, which is building a lithium project in the country, fell as much as 13%. So a bit of a domino effect across companies mining in West Africa, and we've been seeing a pretty steady stream of stories, haven't we? I mean, it's dating all the way back to April, from the rumors that Wagner wanted to take over the Lulo Gunkoto complex, and really, it hasn't been more than a few weeks before we get just more Mali stories, whether it's changing the mining code, Fortuna Silver going out and saying, you know, we don't have a problem, in Burkina Faso, I believe it is, right? And so, or whatever the story of the week is. It has been a pretty steady stream of narrative, shall we say. Now, from my reading on this story, it sounds like the executives are being treated well enough, but they are still detained. There has been no news of their release. So, quite a story there. One expects, just to speculate on our previous $85 million hypothesis, and that there was a payoff, really, one wonders if that is what the junta is waiting for. So big story out of Mali, and just an addendum on it, we have another story on Barrick. This is from staff at mining.com. Barrick CEO expects deal with Mali on new mining code by year end. So let's see if Mark Brisso can negotiate his way into keeping this mine and really keeping it as a profitable Barrick asset here. Let's read a little bit on this story. Barrick Gold CEO Mark Brisso is confident about concluding negotiations with Mali's junta-led government on a new mining code before the end of the year. Discussions between Barrick and Malian authorities on implementing new regulations at the Lulo Gunkoto mining complex, one of the African nation's largest gold mines, have been ongoing for months. Sources cited by Reuters previously reported that Mali is seeking around $500 million in unpaid taxes from Barrick as the government aims to increase revenue from the mining sector. On Thursday, Brisso told Reuters that Barrick has offered Mali 55% of the economic benefits from Lulo Gunkoto, a deal he likened to an agreement reached with Tanzania about five years ago. I mean, I would file that under a deal that's pretty hard to refuse, of 55% of the economic benefits to the government. The CEO declined to comment on Mali's cash demands on claims of unpaid taxes and fines. And we have a quote from Brisso in the Reuters interview, quote, We are prepared to give them more of the economic benefits. The key is to preserve the asset's long-term value. Any increase in basic costs affect project longevity, which ultimately impacts the country, end quote. While Barrick has proposed a larger share of economic benefits for Mali, the company will continue to, quote, carry the capital risk as we have always done, end quote. Brisso noted, adding that discussions remain ongoing. Interesting also in this article, it talked about Barrick's earning call where they missed profit estimates on Thursday, and their all-in sustaining costs for gold rose to $1,507 in Q3 from $1,255 a year earlier. So mining costs going up by over $250 per ounce in one year. 
So a different measure on inflation, perhaps, is the amount of money it costs to mine an ounce of gold. And just a micro statistic here, but quite interesting within that context. Now, turning over to Myanmar, this other ginormous story, where, of course, a rare earth hub was taken over by rebels that the Myanmar military junta has been fighting. The general who leads the military junta in Myanmar visited China last week. So let's get an update here, and this is from Reuters. China pledges support for Myanmar's political transition. So interesting development here. China's Premier Li Chang expressed support for Myanmar's political reconciliation and 2025 election plans in a meeting with Myanmar junta leader Min Aung Hlaing on Wednesday, according to state media outlets. So now we're hearing news that the military junta is going to hold an election next year, in 2025. So it just shows, one could argue, the pressure that this junta is under. Li met Army Chief Min Wang Lang on his first visit to China since seizing power in a 2021 coup in Kunming in southern China's Yunnan province, according to China's official Xinhua News Agency. The junta is planning an election next year in which opposition forces have either been barred from contesting or have refused to take part, dismissing it as a sham. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because the narrative of some of these rebels is that they're pro-democracy forces. So according to what they are saying, they are not buying into this idea that this would be a fair election. Again, dismissing it as a sham. The election is unlikely to be recognized by Western governments, and political analysts expect it will perpetuate the military's dominant role in politics after the generals intervened in 2021 to hit the reset button after a decade of tentative civilian-led democracy. Finally, according to Myanmar's state media on Thursday, Li pledged China's support for Myanmar's election and voiced appreciation for the military government's effort to seek dialogue to end armed conflicts via political means. It quoted Min Aung Lang saying that for Myanmar's rebel alliances to participate in dialogue, they need to present clear and specific actions for peace. According to the report, Lee stressed that the border post should remain under the control of the respective governments and that China reaffirms the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Myanmar and opposes actions that harms the country's interests. Now, a story that was missed here was as that hub was taken over, China tightened its export controls on rare earth metals, interestingly. And we have this story from Tom's Hardware, quoting the New York Times, China tightens export controls on rare earth metals used for chip making. Country now requires exporters to detail how they use restricted materials. Subheadline, China tightens controls on rare earth minerals. The New York Times reports that China is deepening its hold on rare earth minerals by implementing new export restrictions and expanding state ownership of production facilities. This move strengthens its near monopoly on these resources, creating substantial hurdles for foreign tech companies dependent on these materials and increasing their prices. China now requires exporters to submit comprehensive reports detailing how rare earth shipments are used along supply chains. Effective October 1, 2024, This policy enables greater control over who can access these vital resources. Companies outside China, especially in sectors like semiconductors and defense, are directly impacted, as the country supplies almost the entire global market for materials like gallium and germanium. The restrictions have been expanded to include antimony, essential for semiconductors and military equipment. They are part of broader controls on minerals like gallium, crucial for advanced power ICs, and germanium, crucial for radio applications. So pretty interesting developments here. So it continues to be a high-stakes situation over in Myanmar. Continuing over to Congo, we have a story from Deutsche Welle, DW.com, Congo's M23 rebels on the trail of mineral resources. And what's fascinating about this article is they provide a map, and they show really all of the gains since July 2024 are where significant mineral resources are, including Colton and gold. And when you look at this map on DW.com, it's hard not to imagine that this military advancement is not based on the resources 
that are in the Eastern DRC. It's tempting to see this as a direct attempt to seize these resources. So fascinating story there. And also on this front, the M23 rebels have seized a new town near the border with Uganda. As talks drag, and this is from africanews.com, and this was last updated November 5th, M23 rebels continue to gain ground in eastern DRC. The group, who is reportedly backed by Rwanda, seized Sunday the strategic town of Kamandi Gait, according to media reports. So the M23 continue to make inroads here in the eastern DRC. Coming up, we have a very special show for you. We have Stephen Stewart, chair of the OR Group and chair of the Young Mining Professionals Scholarship Fund, and he discusses the latest news from the Young Mining Professionals, what they're working on, and also how you can nominate someone to win the Young Mining Professionals Peter Monk and Ira Thomas Awards, what are the criteria, and also Stephen's thoughts on how Canada could really help develop its natural resources, particularly in regard to infrastructure in the north. So a fabulous interview coming up this episode, as well as Sabrina Bouchard from Investissement Quebec, who discusses the work that Investissement Quebec is doing in order to better understand and help secure battery metals and critical minerals for the North American supply chain and the way that Investissement Quebec is thinking about this crucial issue that has been a topic of conversation for years on this program. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on X at Northern Miner and on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host this podcast and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to Investissement Québec's Sabrina Bouchard for this week's Spotlight. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome to the podcast Sabrina Bouchard, Senior Project Director for the Battery Sector at Investissement Quebec. Sabrina, welcome to the show. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And as the Senior Project Director for the Battery Sector at Investissement Quebec, I guess you are quite involved in the subject of the supply chain, which has been quite topical this year. So why is it important to have a domestic critical mineral supply chain? Well, first of all, maybe I can tell you a little bit what I do. And we're actually a team that's working on the implementation phase of the battery related projects that were announced in the last two years. And me in particular, I'm involved in anything that has to do with the refining of the minerals that go into the battery, as well as the active materials and components of the batteries that goes inside of it. And we're working on the attraction of the rest of the value chain in order to create a complete and sustainable ecosystem. And so the domestic critical mineral supply chain is very important and first of all it's a change in paradigm because in the past in Quebec we would extract our resources and then we would export them internationally. So one of the reasons why it's very important is to reduce our dependency towards certain regions of the world and for examples in the past few months we've had the, the Chinese ban on graphite export. And that's very important to understand that they have about 90% of all the world's capacities of refining this mineral in particular. And so that's why some projects like Nouveau Graphite is the first IRE compliant integrated project from mine to purification of graphite. And it's very important to have projects like that in our domestic value chain. That's one example. But there's also the fact that the projects that are under development here, they have to have ethical practices. They have to comply to environmental norms. They can't just reject byproducts to the river like you would see in some other regions of the world. They also have to be in respect to human rights. And I'm thinking in particular about child labor in some regions of the world again. And it's a politically stable environment. So it's Canada and Quebec, it's free of conflicts. And so it mitigates the risk for companies who come and want to process here and have access to our minerals. Okay, excellent. So in effect, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, when you're discussing this with your colleagues or just in general, do you consider this to a certain degree like a green metal initiative, so to speak? It sounds like to me like at least ESG friendly metals. I mean, how do you frame that in your conversations with your colleagues? Absolutely. Well, that's really the ambition to produce the greenest battery in the world. And one of the ways that we can do it, aside from the environmental norms that we have and what I've discussed already, 
is the green and renewable energy that we have in the province of Quebec in particular. We have 99% of green and renewable energy. And so the companies that come and choose to implement themselves here, just connecting to the grid, it helps them achieving their ESG goals. And so that certainly is our ambition. Okay, excellent. So how do you see this then impacting, say, the economy in North America, say Canada and the U.S. in terms of bringing in these ESG-friendly metals. How do you see that impacting, and what importance does it play in the kind of local supply chain? Well, that really is the OEMs that drive the demand for that, and that really comes from the consumers. So the consumers' EV adoption in North America is related to the demand that they're going to have for such green minerals and metals and components. But there's also the Inflation Reduction Act that is a driver. So the Inflation Reduction Act, it has a certain timeline and there's certain contents amount that's related to the to this timeline. And the point is to have minerals or components or projects in the supply chain that are coming from the North American supply chain or without the involvement of foreign entities of concern, more generally speaking. And that has an effect on the project financing pace and also the timing. So there's the ESG criterions, but there's also where they come from and how it's processed. Okay, excellent. So what are the biggest challenges that you're finding then in, you know, attempting to start to model and implement, let's say, this kind of initiative? Like I would imagine, for instance, one of the biggest challenges might be cost. I mean, you know, there's China able to, you know, process rare earths and graphite and copper and nickel at perhaps a lower price. I mean, how do you see this working out? What are some of the biggest challenges you face? Well, right now, there's a lot of doubts that were spread during the American election campaign. Will IRA continue or not? And also, it's a law that needs majority to change both at the Senate and House of Representatives. A lot of modalities can be changed, but there's also the adoption of tariffs that can be adopted, might not be adopted on Chinese cars, for instance, or materials from certain regions of the world. And that certainly has an effect on do companies have a business case or not. So that certainly is one of the aspects that's looked at. But there's also a lot of these companies that are working on making sure that they can work on the improvement of their OPEC, so operational costs. And how can we work on R&D to have operations that are maybe lower or that, that we can have more than one processes to have more than one outputs, for instance. Okay, excellent. So it sounds like a lot of battery metals are the focus in these kinds of discussions in reshoring, so to speak, the supply chain. Is this oriented, would you say, primarily to battery metals or exclusively to battery metals? Like, how do you see that as, again, a project director for the battery sector at MSD Small Quebec? Mostly at the battery metals level, mostly because there's the uh, the percentage of content from the weight of the battery. So it's actual value. So since most of the value of the battery comes from nickel, lithium, graphite, that's mostly where the focus is. However, there are some modalities around the content for separators, for instance, cans and lids, and that's taken into account. But that's really the value of the whole battery that is kind of driving the choices of the companies to go towards one types of project versus another and their choice of chemistries and the types of unknown materials that they want to go towards. They're really driven by that. And so as we start to wrap up here, how are you approaching, you know, implementing this kind of reshoring of the supply chain? So what I can tell you is that the companies that we work with They have to evolve according to the type of demand that they have. And so they are looking to invest and change in their chemistries, for instance, and look at what materials are going to improve their performance while reducing the cost and follow where the market is going. And so we are working with our research centers and IREC from Hydro-Quebec is a great example where they are working on the optimization of new processes and the development of new materials. And that's really important in order to have an ecosystem and a battery sector in our province that is going to be sustainable and that's going to adapt 
to where the market is going, where the consumers are going. And that's really us working with our ecosystem to make sure that we can deepen it. Okay, so as we wrap up here then, Sabrina, what is the takeaway here for people that are listening? Like, what do you want them to know about what Ambestissement Quebec is doing in regard to critical minerals, the supply chain, the green transition? What do you want them to know? Well, maybe that also we've been working and there was a lot of discussion around the battery sector in particular, but we're having a broader view on development of these critical and strategic minerals. So they're interesting for the battery value chain, but the battery value chain is not on its own. It's part of the the energy transition, more generally speaking. And so the value chain, they're also important for the production of the electrolyzers that will be used for electrochemistry, for instance, processes, and then from hydrogen production, but also in the solar panel productions and microelectronic components and so on. And so we really have a broader view on the actual technologies that are under development now, what's going to be probably developed for the last five years on the market, the next 10 years, but also the other types of applications. Sabrina Bouchard, Senior Project Director for the Battery Sector at MST Small Quebec. Thank you for joining us on this week's Spotlight. Thank you. And thank you once again to Investissement Québec and the Government of Quebec for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast. Turning to the website, we have post-election fallout. Rio Tinto exec asks Trump administration to speed up permitting. So this is Reuters via Mining.com, November 7th. So not wasting any time. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump's new administration should focus on speeding up the permitting process to ensure there is enough copper for the energy transition, said a Rio Tinto executive on Thursday, referring to its stalled Arizona mine. Rio Tinto, along with partner BHP Group, is developing the Resolution Copper Mine, which could supply more than one quarter of the country's domestic copper needs for the highly conductive metal. But around the world, it takes years to develop a mine, partly due to the time it takes to get permits. Chief Commercial Officer Bold Batar, speaking at the Financial Times Commodity Summit in Singapore. Developing progress on the mine is currently tied up in U.S. courts. It has faced opposition from Native Americans because it could cause a massive crater that would swallow a religious site where Arizona's San Carlos Apache worshipped. The new Trump administration will be able to either approve the mine or keep its developments essentially frozen. Batar added that Rio Tinto is committed to working with Native American groups as it considers how to best develop the mine. As Rio Tinto looks at how it will grow, Batar sees Argentina as a main focus, where its Rincon Lithium project sits, as well as some assets of Arcadium Lithium, which it agreed to purchase for $6.7 billion last month. As such, the miner will be busy integrating those existing businesses before it has time to focus on any mega-mergers on the scale of BHP's $49 billion tilt at Anglo-American earlier this year, he said. Quote, I don't think we have to prove to the market that we can create value from lithium first, end quote, he said. For Rio's mainstay, iron ore, China's steel demand is shifting to higher-grade ore, which is less carbon-intensive to turn into steel, as overall housing sector demand falls but is offset by steel demand from the energy transition. Quote, the demand for high-grade ore continues to be strong. The new industries such as electric vehicles and energy transition are picking up the drop in the residential sector. End quote. Continuing on, U.S. Strategic Metals gets a $100 million government loan for Missouri Cobalt Project. This is by a staff writer at northernminer.com. U.S. Strategic Metals said Tuesday that its $100 million loan application has been granted expedited approval by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services in recognition of the potential job creation by the company's critical minerals project. The closely held company is planning to mine what it considers to be the largest cobalt reserve in North America. It holds an 18-year mineral supply of cobalt, plus nickel and copper, on a 7.3-square-kilometer site in Missouri known as the Madison Mine Project. The project was granted expedited approval because domestic production of critical minerals such as cobalt, nickel, and lithium is squarely in the national interest of the United States, U.S. Strategic said in a news release. And here's a quote from CEO Stacy Hasty, who said in a statement, quote, This approval is a recognition of our plans to create jobs in Missouri, The Missouri project will secure domestic supplies of essential materials, generate high-quality jobs, and boost the regional economy, end quote. 
Continuing on, YU seeks $2.7 billion for Ford-backed Indonesia nickel plant. This is Bloomberg News via Mining.com. Shenzhen YU Cobalt, one of the world's largest nickel producers, is sounding out banks for roughly $2.7 billion in financing for its Ford Motor Cobalt project in Indonesia, according to people familiar with the matter. If I had to guess, it was about eight months ago where we were seeing stories of how BYD was building car factories outside of these Indonesian nickel smelters, basically right beside them. So this is quite interesting in that context. YU partnered on the project with Ford and Minor PT Valley Indonesia to make battery-grade nickel for electric vehicles. Indonesia accounts for more than half of global nickel output and has been aggressively wooing foreign investment in its domestic processing industry over the last decade or so. Scrolling down a bit, YU said last year construction of the Pomola plant would require about three years. It has not provided an updated timeline, but said earlier this year preliminary work had been carried out on the project. And meanwhile, here's another interesting story. China, Indonesia sealed $10 billion in deals focused on green energy and tech. This is Reuters via Mining.com. China and Indonesia signed deals worth $10 billion at the Indonesia-China Business Forum in Beijing on Sunday, spanning sectors including food, new energy, technology, and biotechnology, Chinese state media reported. The forum followed a meeting on Saturday between Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indonesian President Prabowo Subianto, who is in China through November 10th, the first country he has visited since taking office last month. Prabowo, who won Indonesia's presidential election in February, also chose China for his first visit as president-elect, underscoring Jakarta's commitment to stronger strategic ties with Beijing. In a joint statement after the leaders' meeting, the countries agreed to enhance collaboration in sectors such as the new energy vehicles, lithium batteries, photovoltaics, and the digital economy. They also pledged to strengthen partnership on the global energy transition and jointly ensure the security of global mineral supply and industrial chains, the statement said. Prabowo, in a separate statement, said he was optimistic close cooperation between the two countries would improve regional stability. Quote, we must set an example that in this era, cooperation, not confrontation, is the path to peace and prosperity. And quote, Prabowo said, adding Indonesia was committed to supporting Chinese investors. Continuing on, Japan, Peru to agree on cooperation in mineral mining technology. This is Reuters via Mining.com. The leaders of Japan and Peru will sign a joint statement later this month on cooperation in mineral mining technology aimed at strengthening their supply chains for critical minerals through Japanese technology, the Nikkei Business Daily said on Saturday. Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba, who plans to visit Peru for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC Leaders Summit on November 15th and 16th, will also hold a bilateral meeting with Peru's leader, according to Nikkei. Resource-poor Japan has been actively reinforcing global supply chains for critical minerals, essential components for electric vehicle batteries, renewable energy, and other technologies supporting a decarbonized society. The two governments aim to create stable supply chains in Peru for critical minerals such as copper and zinc through technology provided by Japanese companies, the Nikkei said without citing specific sources. In addition, Japan and Peru plan to compile a 10-year roadmap outlining concrete measures across five areas, including economic cooperation for securing mineral resources and energy procurement, personal exchange, and security, Nikkei said. And just a few more headlines here. A Cisco Development's Caribou Gold project faces legal threat as Zatsul demand consent. This is by Henry Lazenby at the Northern Miner. The Zatsul First Nation may sue the British Columbia government and a Cisco Development if its concerns aren't addressed in the permitting process for the Caribou Gold project. The project in East Central BC threatens community health, cultural sites, and traditional practices due to potential contamination and restricted land access, the nation said in a statement Thursday. Quote, If the permitting process moves ahead without addressing our concerns, any permits that are issued will be highly vulnerable to legal challenges, end quote, Chief Rhonda Phillips said. The Zetsul has called on the BC government and OSISCO to halt the project until its issues are resolved and its free prior and informed consent is granted.
Continuing on, Cadelco partners with Toyota and Mitsui to explore decarbonization of mining fleet. Cadelco has signed a memorandum of understanding with Japanese companies Toyota and Mitsui for a strategic collaboration in the development and testing of sustainable mobility solutions in its mining divisions. The agreement seeks to promote competitive and environmentally responsible mining, minimizing its carbon footprint through electrification, the Chilean state-owned copper miner said in a news release on Thursday. So Toyota and Mitsui partnering with Cadelco for its mining fleet. Another headline, world's biggest cobalt miner is gloomy on the EV metals future. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. The world's number one cobalt miner is sounding the alarm over the shrinking role of the metal in electric vehicle batteries. Chinese company CMOC Group, which has been churning out cobalt much faster than rivals like Glencore, said the importance of the raw material in the energy transition is declining rapidly. And here's a quote from Zhu Jing, a spokesman for CMOC, who said in an emailed response to questions, quote, We predict that EV batteries will never return to the era that relies on cobalt. Cobalt is far less important than imagined, end quote, and the proportion of batteries containing the metal may eventually drop to less than a tenth, he said. So quite a bearish take on cobalt. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market for context. The U.S. 10-year bond is yielding 4.32%, edging just 0.01% higher than last week. The U.K. 10-year gilt is yielding 4.43%, that is down 0.05% from last week. The Italy 10-year bond is yielding 3.6%, that is down 0.09% from last week. And the German 10-year Bund is also lower at 2.33%, that is down 0.08% from last week. And once again, in the opposite direction, the Japanese 10-year bond is higher, yielding 1%, and that is 0.07% higher than last week. So interesting to watch the dynamics here between some of the major bond markets. Turning to precious metals, gold is trading at $2,628.69 per ounce. That is $104 lower than last week, so gold getting smashed. Silver is trading at $30.71 per ounce. That is $1.09 lower than last week. Platinum is trading at $957.70 per ounce. That is $21 lower than last week. And palladium is trading at $977.50 per ounce, back below $1,000, and that is down $97 on the week, and down a little more than $230 from two weeks ago. So palladium experiencing a severe correction off of that recent spike. And turning to industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.22 per pound. That is 18 cents lower than last week. Iron ore edges slightly higher at $103.82 per metric ton. That is $1.33 higher than last week. Aluminum is slightly lower at $1.17 per pound. That is 2 cents lower than last week. Lead edges slightly lower at 92 cents per pound. That is a penny lower than last week. Nickel is also slightly lower at $7.30 per pound. That is also a penny lower than last week. Tin is also slightly lower at $14.36 per pound. That is three cents lower than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $11.02 per pound. Lithium is at $10.07 per kilogram, down 15 cents on the week, and again threatening the $10 level as it continues to struggle. Uranium is also lower at $76.55 per pound. That is $2 lower than last week. And zinc also edges lower at $1.35 per pound. That is $0.03 lower than last week. Zooming out, precious metals taking quite a hit. Industrial metals just kind of edging lower. Perhaps taking a wait-and-see approach here. 
but overall edging lower. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the program Stephen Stewart, chair of the Org Group and chair of the Young Mining Professional Scholarship Fund. We discuss the latest news on young mining professionals, as well as the winners of the Peter Monk and Ira Thomas Awards, as well as the criteria for nominating someone in the shortened award cycle this year. So nominations are already open for next year's winners which will be announced at PDAC, as well as Stephen's views on the Canadian mining sector and what can be done to practically help out the development of mineral resources in Canada. I hope you enjoy the conversation, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the Northern Miner Podcast, Stephen Stewart, Chair of the Org Group and Chair of the Young Mining Professional Scholarship Fund. Stephen, welcome back. Adrian, so good to be back. Always love to appear on the Northern Miner Podcast with you. Thank you. We're always thrilled to have you, Stephen, and hear your insights from your very unique vantage point in the Canadian mining sector. So not only are you involved in mining, of course, you're involved with YMP, Young Mining Professionals. and so. Tell us what the latest is on Young Mining Professionals. I mean, we had the award winners. We had an article come out on September 24th celebrating the new Ira Thomas and Peter Monk award winners. Can you tell us about the awards and just the latest developments on what's happening? Of course. Well, you're right. Just this past September, we had our big gala event here in Toronto at the Canoe Restaurant at the top of the uh, TD Centre, beautiful uh, venue. Actually, I got married there, so it brought back memories. But uh, we were very pleased to welcome Scott Bergdahl and Ella Cullen as this year's Peter Monk and Ira Thomas Award winners, very deserving candidates. Uh, Both are different sort of segments of the industry, but both very bright, both very successful in their own right. It's a wonderful event. Lots of representatives from Barrick and, of course, Ira Thomas were there. And it's always a nice event to celebrate young people in mining. And then as we pivot, usually we do the awards ceremony at the PDAC. We missed that opportunity in 2024. But guess what? In 2025, we're back on track and we're going to have, I guess, a short cycle, if you will, short cycle year where the nominations for 2025's Peter Monk and Ira Thomas Awards are already open. So go to youngminingprofessionals.com and nominate each of your favorite male and female mining entrepreneur and and come PDAC the Saturday prior to the the first, you know, to the Sunday of the PDAC, we'll be having our awards at the Shangri-La here in Toronto. So back on track. So there's lots going on a short year. We're looking for great nominations. And then, of course, in the background, we're running our scholarship, which is certainly a labor of love for me. I think it's how the group gives back. It's certainly how I give back. Me and those like Tony Moreau, who's been instrumental in, in growing this group alongside me, pay a lot of attention and invest a lot of our time uh, towards raising the money for the scholarships last year. Uh, I guess this year's scholarships roster is closed. So we have, uh, I think, nearly 50 scholarships and nearly a quarter of a million dollars this year the group is giving away. And we're going to do the same thing in 2026. So stay tuned on the the applications for next year's scholarships and anybody listening out there who's in the mining industry who wants to support young people and invest in our most precious natural resource, which is our young people getting into this industry. Give us a call. We need your help. We're always looking to raise funds and, and again, invest it into these young people. And we're all volunteers. This is what's so unique about the young mining professionals, in particular, the scholarship funds. We're all volunteers. It's a charitable organization. We have tax credits, and 100% of every dollar that a donor gives flows directly to the students. So it's really, you know, a wonderful charitable opportunity that really does invest back into the industry. So it's something I personally and everybody who's associated with YMP is incredibly proud of. So just for the audience, then to clarify, so there are YMP awards, and then there is the YMP scholarship fund. So the YMP awards, as you're saying, happened about a month ago on September 24th, and you're saying it's going to be a shortened cycle, so nominations are open. And so just briefly, if you can, uh, refresh our memory for people that might be interested in nominating someone. What are the criteria for being nominated for the YMP Awards? The YMP Awards, you have to be sub 40 at a specific date. I can't remember which specific date it is, but generally sub 40. 
to be involved in the natural resource extraction industry. And those are the really two primary categories. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a Canadian focused initiative. But as we've discovered, Ella Cullen and others around the world have been nominated over the years. So it's it's really just about celebrating entrepreneurialism in the mining industry and focusing it on young people. Because I guess, you know, organizations like, well, the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, which is, of course, affiliated with the Northern Miner and looking forward to your event there in January. But there's nothing towards young people. So that's where the YMP filled that gap. As I said, the rules or the guidelines are fairly loose, but it's, it's again, about anybody under 40. Okay, excellent. So as far as the winners then, we had Ella Cullen and Scott Burdall. Ella Cullen won the Ira Thomas Award. What can you tell us about Ella Cullen? What made her the winner of this year's Ira Thomas Award? We had a lot of great nominees this year on both the male and the female categories. Ella stood out um, just for her entrepreneurial drive. One, she was the driving force and the the founder of her business. And, you know, just like Peter Monk is the founder of the business, just like Ira Thomas, the founder of businesses, that carries a lot of weight if you're the principal behind any one particular business in our sector. And then I think she was unique because her twist on the industry, she's not drilling drill holes or mining open pits. She's tracking critical minerals and doing so with blockchain, which is interesting and and something that is nascent, but going to be more and more applicable and relevant uh, as I think we progress and we want to make sure, just like, you know, when the movie Blood Diamonds came out, you know, many, many years ago, the world started paying attention to where are we getting these products? And so I think when you have metals that can be melted like gold, it's it's almost impossible to track, but it's people like Ella using modern technology is helping the industry track these so people can feel comfortable that they don't come from conflict zones and other other reasons i'm sure but anyways i thought that was an interesting twist so yes she was the clear winner this year indeed it is becoming seemingly increasingly important uh with the kind of greenification so to speak of the mining industry and just metals and where they come from it seems to be increasingly important and she is from New Zealand. So I guess one criteria is like, this is global, right? And she lives in Portugal. Like, it's not like you have to be Canadian or North American to apply for this. That's correct. We've had many international winners over the years. And, and Ella is very international, if I recall correctly. I don't have her full address registry, but I believe she now lives in Portugal. And she sort of lived all over the world, as, as she noted in her uh, acceptance speech. So she is an interesting gal. Okay, excellent. And Scott Burdell, he won the Peter Monk Award. And what can you tell us about Scott? Why did he win uh, this year's Peter Monk Award? Well, again, he's the leader behind Snowline, and Snowline has been an unqualified success. It's a wonderful project. He's putting out a fantastic drill results, really eye-popping drill results. It's, it's logistically challenged as it's really in a remote part of the Yukon. But when you have grades like that and what they've been able to delineate in terms of size over a relatively short period, it gets people's attention. And he's also been very successful in attracting strategic investment and, you know, running a company up to six, seven hundred million dollars. I haven't checked it lately, but it's certainly been in that neighborhood at some point in time. So it, it looks like he's on to something there, uh, something that will be a mine. And so uh, he's created shareholder value. He's been disciplined and how he's allocated capital in terms of building a resource quickly. And I think he's just a nice guy. And if you look at his education, he's a real bright young man. And it was nice to see him. He's got two young kids. He brought his wife. I think he was really proud. He brought his chairman. You know, it was a nice event. It's always nice to see the family come together and support and, and see their loved ones get acknowledged like Scott did. So look, he was a, a very well-deserving um, winner of the Peter Monk Award this year. And it was tight race. I tell you this, I won't list the second through eight people who were nominated. But look, the Peter Monk Award is very, very tight and hotly contested. And, and I'm excited to see who's going to win in 2025 to follow up with Scott. Indeed, when the family comes in and everything. I think that's why one of the reasons I like talking to you so much, Stephen, is because you're very grounded in what it means, these kind of events, again, with the family and everyone being there. For those that aren't familiar with Snowline, then, like, is it a gold project? Like you mentioned, it was in the Yukon. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about the project? Is he CEO? He is the CEO. I don't know if he formed the company, but he's basically been there since the beginning. In fact, I do believe he formed the company. And, you know, he started it from nothing, right? Just a typical junior. Again, I don't know if they started at a $5 million company or a $25 million company, but, you know, they were just your typical exploration company who eventually hit it out of the park. And they did so in a relatively quick time frame. 
And they did so in a very challenging geographic position. It's not easy to do exploration up where they are. It's not cheap. You have to raise a lot of money. You have to coordinate a big team, right? Just the logistics of getting in and out of a remote, you know, fly in, fly in. Maybe it's not even, I don't even know if they have a, a, an airstrip and maybe a helicopter. The logistics of that and coordinating a team just make it exponentially more challenging and expensive. And they've overcome those challenges. And, and time will tell if the deposit is big enough and high enough grade to support the infrastructure required. But since it is a gold project, Logistics is less important than, say, you know, a copper project where you need to have rail and you, you can concentrate the gold and fly it out in a helicopter easy enough. So my understanding is it looks to be an open pitable deposit. The grades are really, really good. Well, you need good grades to support an economic situation where you are. But look, it looks really interesting. It has a lot of people excited. And I think he's just done a wonderful job on the capital market side, but also on the technical side. And trust me, both are needed. <laughs> Indeed, as we've long discussed here in previous interviews. And just on Yukon, I mean, you know, it was such a wild year for Yukon, at least from, I guess, you know, the government perspective and the mining industry perspective with all of the kind of circumstance with Victoria Gold. And so I guess it's kind of a good news story, right, for Yukon uh, with Snowline Gold in a dramatic year. Like, what is your sense of Yukon mining as someone who's kind of a fixture here in the Canadian mining sector? Well, I personally have never invested into the Yukon directly at the asset level. I'm a shareholder of a few companies out there. I mean, clearly the Yukon has some, you know, wonderful endowment. Clearly it's unfortunate what happened earlier this year with the tailings incident. And I think that has certainly given the Yukon a black eye. But the good news is that black eye is going to heal up because that province is pro-mining. And why are they pro-mining? Well, one, because it's in the culture up there, but they need mining. That's the truth. And so I think they're going to go back and they're going to evaluate and they're going to make some changes. And, you know, the business is very good at adapting and changing and getting better. In fact, I think we are one of the most attentive industries out there in terms of being green and ESG and socially conscious. I mean, a lot of these are buzzwords, but nonetheless, like we care because we have to care because we are we're partners with the communities. We're partners with the government. You cannot operate a business like it was operated 100 years ago. So I think it goes without saying, if you're serious about mind development, you have to pay attention to all these acronyms. So as I digress, the Yukon is a wonderful place to do business. They know how important the mining industry is just because of their remoteness. There's, again, I can't list their top three industries, but I'd suggest that mining is probably number one or number two up there. So they can't afford for too long to ignore it or shut it down without having real social impacts on their economy, which in the world we live in, the economy is how things are driven and, and what people most often care about. So I would say this is an opportunity to make well-placed patient investments in the Yukon as they may be discounted or maybe they're getting out of the hole right now. But look, these things do take time, but mining in the Yukon is not going anywhere. That's my gut. And just finally on Yukon, I mean, what is your sense of the infrastructure situation in Yukon? Like, do you get the sense that they need a lot of, I don't know, roads or power? Is it, what is your sense of kind of like the Yukon from a infrastructure perspective? Well, again, not being an expert, but I, I have a sense and the sense is it, it, the answer is it depends. I mean, some places have great infrastructure, but the vast, vast majority of Yukon has virtually no infrastructure. It's the, it's the, I don't say it's the final frontier, but it's certainly, you know, a frontier and, and there's not much going on there in terms of infrastructure. And I'd say the same is true for the vast majority of Canada. So Yukon is not alone. You look at the territories, geez, you look at Northern Ontario, you know, I, I would say Quebec and British Columbia have done very good jobs, mostly because of mining and other major infrastructure projects and providing infrastructure up to the North. But aside from those two provinces, you know, you reach a certain level, you know, away from the American border, if you will. And there's just basically nothing up there. But wilderness, of course, there's First Nations and other small communities. But in terms of roads and rail, there's nothing. And I think that is low hanging fruit. I'd love to see the government jump on the infrastructure bandwagon. And I always like to cite the interstate highway system that was built by Eisenhower back in the 50s and, and how that was just absolutely instrumental in unlocking the value of what America has become and what America continues to be and will be. One of the government's primary functions should be to build the infrastructure, to allow private businesses to grow. If we had better access to the North uh, in all the provinces from an exploration standpoint, uh, that means our costs go down. So if, if it costs you 50% of if you can drive to it as opposed to helicopters, well, that allows us to invest twice as much money at half the risk. 
and hence statistically more likely to find these deposits and develop the deposits and, and grow them and so on and so forth. But for a lot of reasons, which we won't get into, there's just been this complete absence of investment in the North. And I think that's a major problem and a major missed opportunity. I'd love to see some political leadership at the federal and all the provincial levels to get together and start building infrastructure responsibly, of course, as I said, just like mine development, that goes without saying, but also not like, you know, fastidiously responsibly. We do have to get to a point where we have a coalition of the willing, those who are interested in responsible economic development and for the betterment of these people who are in these remote communities. A lot of these people are wary of call it the South coming, creeping up North because of environmental degradation or other sort of potential reasons. But the truth is living up there is so expensive and the lack of health care and, and, you know, to, to get a dozen eggs is 20 bucks and there's no doctors up there. So there's lots of room for infrastructure in the Yukon. There's lots of room for infrastructure in Ontario and other provinces, which would be great for the national economy, but also wonderful for the local communities on the whole. You know, to your point, I mean, you're inspiring thoughts in me here. It's sort of like it seems like it would be a generally speaking, a pretty popular issue. I mean, and, you know, building out infrastructure in the north. And I mean, as as we learn throughout history, I mean, how do you get economic development? It's really uh, trade routes, right? I mean, the more people that are traveling along these roads, uh, the more economic development you're going to have. So it just seems like the first obvious step really that needs to happen here. And with all of the government budget money that is being spent, at least like voters can say, well, at least this is going to something that I can kind of see and feel. Well, how can you invest in something if you can't get there? Right. So like it's about the path of least resistance and capital will flow towards it. And if there's massive resistance in terms of, you know, just again, all economic projects are evaluated on a, you know, apples to apples basis. And if you can put, you know, a million dollars into a project in, say, Kirkland Lake, where you can drill to and you can get. 5,000 meters out of that. Whereas, you know, you have to go to the ring of fire in Northern Ontario and you have a million dollars and you can only, you know, probably put 500 meters. And if you're talking about grassroots exploration, where are the chances of your odds making a discovery? You need more meters. And that's just one, you know, anecdote, but they have to allow us to get up there to make these investments. We know there's mineral endowments up there and, and it's more than just mineral endowments. It's, there's other opportunities. So the sky's the limit. But we need to make smarter investments at the government level and all levels of government towards infrastructure, you know, in a way, you know, less on on war and other silly things and more on true economic foundational investments like infrastructure that have exponential and frankly, incalculable returns. If one were to evaluate the capex and opex of the interstate highway system in the United States, it would be net negative and they wouldn't build it. Because you just can't incorporate the long-term terminal values, as they would say in the Excel spreadsheets, that make it sort of uh, economic on how we currently evaluate financial projects. Plus, there's all these externalities, right? So like when you're talking about building a mine in the north and you want to look at it at the mine level, well, sure, you know, does it have an IRR north of 20? Okay, fine, it's, it's economic. But think about all the other ancillary businesses that are not captured in that one particular financial analysis in terms of royalties, taxes, drilling contracts, catering contracts, insurance businesses, and eventually car dealerships. I mean, it just like things grow and it's you, they can't be captured in how we evaluate financial projects. That's why you need the government to come in there and build these, these roads and rail and other infrastructure so that private business can come in there and do what it does best and, and create returns and improve the livelihoods for the people in and around the communities. Because I believe firmly that if you are fortunate enough to have a mineral endowment in, in your neighborhood, it's that community that should be benefiting most, along with shareholders, of course, who take the risk in investing in, in that and, and more often than not uh, lose in this business because exploration is risky. But there's no question these northern communities should and will benefit from mineral development. Speaking of exploration, you just came from the Explorer Conference in Quebec as you know, chair of the Ore Group. What was it like at the conference and what sort of sense were you getting? I mean, of course, the explorers haven't necessarily participated as much in the wild times that are happening in the gold price. We are seeing some of the gold stocks start to move in the GDX. What was your sense at the Explorer Conference? Well, it's, it's always a great conference. It's uh, put on by the AEMQ, which is the uh, Quebec Provincial Mineral Association, kind of like the PDAC for Quebec. 
it's always a great conference to be. All the players, you know, the financial, government, and exploration and mining companies are there. And it's an opportunity to uh, see and be seen and make connections. And it's a wonderful conference to go to. And I always enjoy it in, in Montreal. And, and, and so it's a wonderful city. What is the attitude? Well, it's, it's, it's I guess, cautiously optimistic. I think gold price is at the top of everybody's mind. And that typically leads the charge out of a bear market. Now, I guess everybody's a little cautiously optimistic, cautious because there's been a lot of head fakes. You know, are we here yet? You know, earlier this year in Q1, it looked like we were there at the beginning of a run, but then it pulled back. And we've had a number of those over the last many, many years. And so people are just tepid, but optimistic. You have to be an optimist in this in this business because, you know, it is so volatile and, and failure is so common. And it's not failure because of negligence. It's because it's a risky business. And so, you know, or you, you have to have a, a, a stomach to weather these roller coasters. And you also have to have conviction that, that our industry is, is essential and the minerals that we mine, all of them are critical and that investment will follow the path to least resistance and back to our industry again. And it'll do so, you know, rapidly. And that's where the returns. And that's why people, you know, segment of this market love this industry because, because of the volatility, but it works both ways. And certainly we've forgotten that it can work to the upside, but it, it's coming. I can't tell you when, unfortunately, Adrian. I wish I could, but but I assure you, it is coming. We will be popular again. We will be, you know, the tech bros again. I think you know we've been beaten down so hard. We're going to be extremely popular, and that's exciting. And again, I don't know when it's going to come, but but when it does come, it'll again. I think it'll it will heal a lot of the negative sentiment that surrounds our industries. We're unpopular because we're falsely deemed as bad for the environment. I think that's a total false narrative. But we're also viewed negatively because of the lack of returns we've delivered, right? It's it's easy to like somebody or dislike a, a, an industry where they're not making money. But when they make money, boy, do they love you. And that attracts young people, again, going back to the young mining professionals. If, if we can show returns like Bitcoin showed or like marijuana showed, well, boy, when you graduate from your master's degree, where are you going to go? Lately, they've been going elsewhere. But I think the stars will align and and the age gap, uh, the talent gap that this industry faces between, you know, call it the, the those who are in the 60s and 50s relative to the 20s. There's a huge gap in between, you know, it's sort of my era. I'm in my my 40s and, and there's there's not a lot of me, fewer and fewer. But I think the good times will return. And when I say the good times, I mean sustained good times. I don't mean six months or a year. I mean, you know, a nice 10 year cycle where we get back to being serious about mineral development. We get serious about securing the supply chain for all metals to support our industry and, and to make sure that that we have the metals that we need to build our economy, build our future, to compete with those around the world, particularly, you know, China, who's done a, a marvelous job at securing minerals around the world, Africa in particular. Now they're in South America. They're no longer really allowed here in Canada, which I think is a mistake, not because I want China here, but because I, I want the free flow of capital. And, and I think what the government needs to do is in, instead of banning capital, they should be incenting the right type of capital. I think that's a more proactive and sensible approach and giving tax incentives and other breaks for industries investing in us as an industry. Long term, I'm very bullish on Canada's economy. I'm very bullish on Canada's mining industry and our young people because we have such a wonderful talent pool here. But we need to pay attention to bringing them back in. And that's why I love investing my time into the young mining professionals. Okay, excellent. To your point, my sense of it is the mining industry is getting less unpopular all the time. We're not popular yet, but it's not quite as hated, let's put it that way, as maybe eight years ago, you know, 2016, it's almost a touch glamorous now when I'm at a little art opening and I say I do a podcast on natural resources. It's not like, again, I'm, I'm not waiting for someone to ask me, like, how dare you and uh, waiting for an explanation for me to defend myself, you know. So I sense the winds changing here. So as we're wrapping up here, Stephen, what are the challenges? I mean, you're a chair of the OR group. You have several companies uh, within the OR group. What are the main challenges? Like what I remember and my sense of what the explorers are facing, basically it was regulation was at the top as well as financing. Uh, those seem to be like the two main challenges from what I could tell. What is your sense? Are we seeing improvement on, I would think there's some improvement, but I don't know. Like what are you seeing on your side? Well, in financing, sure, things are loosening up, but that's something that needs to solve itself. There's no one thing that the regulators or government, you know, can do. Really, industry has to do that. I, I do think there's too many juniors out there, which is a, a common thread. Um, so instead of financing 3,000 of them, we should be financing, well, probably 
300 of them. But I mean, that's an extreme. But the point is, capital should be focused on the good projects and the good people that are behind them. Now the trick is finding those. I'm sure your typical retail investor would love to be able to focus their money and that's the whole trick. But it, there's nothing anybody can do about that. So it is what it is and capital flows in and flows out. But certainly the capital markets have loosened up. And, and again, that's the charges led by gold. Gold has been extremely strong, although the equities have yet to catch up. But I assure you, if gold holds this ground or continues its trajectory upwards, the equities will catch up and do so with a good deal of torque. And I'm talking about the new monster, of the barracks of the world, the big, big guys. And then it'll trickle down to the I am golds of the world. And then it'll trickle down to my world where we have an extreme level of beta uh, um, to metals prices. So and again, that's why people come into the junior miners and they accept this level of risk is because they want 10 to 1. 50 to 1, 100 to 1. Those types of returns are available to our industry, especially in good times. You mentioned regulation. Effectively, no, I see no no change in regulation whatsoever, and probably the inverse, I think. And again, you can't paint the, the governments with one brush. There are many different governments and many different eras and different levels of governments within. But by and large, no, nothing's changed. There's some jurisdictions that I won't quote that are headed totally in the wrong direction in terms of just extending the permitting and permissions timeframes. You know, so it's it's absurd, frankly, and we need to get serious about it. Again, we talked about the path of least resistance. If you are money and money looks towards the path of least resistance and, and seeking its returns, why not invest in, in West Africa where we have exposure to? And, it's, you know, it's it's there's different risks there. There's always a risk, but different risks, but it's not necessarily permitting. You can get something built in three to five years in West Africa from discovery to call it pouring gold, whereas in Canada... You know, it's 20, 25, 30 years. Where is capital going to flow? And why does it take so long? The argument that we want to be socially, environmentally conscious is, is I think, a false argument. Of course, we want to be socially and environmentally conscious. But it doesn't take 25 to 30 years to figure it out. It just means that the industry and the governments are beholden to special interest groups who have conflicting interests with economic development often. And so things just get caught up in a bureaucratic lawsuit, you know, permitting nightmare. And it's unfortunate. You shouldn't need 250 permits to build a mine. You should, you know, effectively, simplistically need one. And I don't mean to, to lighten it like that. Obviously, you know, it's not just one, but they do need to eliminate the black box of how do you get this done? And and maybe they have, I don't want to suggest more bureaucracy, but maybe instead of you know, having multiple, multiple ministries in charge, they just have one ministry of mines who's responsible. And what they need to do is hire high quality people who really understand the challenges of the industry and really understand how the industry works. I'm not saying they don't have that, but I, I do think that most in the industry don't flock to that sort of thing because of the perception of bureaucracy. But the government needs to get serious about a mineral development strategy that if they want to electrify everything like they say they want to do, which you know evidence suggests they're not serious about it yet, they need to streamline the permitting. They need to tear down the system completely. All of these dogmas about permitting need to be reevaluated. You know, go back like, you know, I'll pull an Elon Musk or a, a Peter Thiel and say, go back to first principles. You know, there's a better way to do it. We need to figure that out if we're going to be competitive because 10 years ago, Canada was considered a, a leader and now we're, you know, barely in the discussion. So uh, the good news is these changes are not that difficult. We just need conviction, leadership, and some good ideas and Canada can be back on top. So that's the good news. And also on YMP scholarships, what is happening with YMP scholarships? How do people get involved and what should they do? Are you guys raising money? Give us some information on YMP scholarships. Of course, we're always raising money, Adrian. So thank you for asking. Just like just like we're always raising money in the exploration business. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of a core focus of my life is raising money. Uh, in particular, Young Mining Professional Scholarships, we have wonderful sponsors or donor partners, as we call them, everyone from Barrick to Kinross to Equinox to Sprott, the list goes on. Of course, Ore Group is a big part of that donor package. So we're always looking for new partners to come on in and support. So anybody listening to this, give me a call. We're happy to design a scholarship that suits your needs and, and wants. And again, 100% of those dollars you donate is a tax credit to your company. And 100% of those dollars, even more importantly, goes directly to that student. We're, we're totally supported by the generosity of the industry who wants to give back. We also give the industry wonderful coverage just because YMP has a huge reach. And we have a partnership with the Northern Miner and we really get your name out there. So people will know you're doing good. Stephen Stewart, chair of the Ore Group and chair of Young Mining Professional Scholarship. Thank you for joining us and sharing your insights on this week's Northern Miner podcast. Thanks so much, Adrian.
thank you once again to Investissement Quebec and the government of Quebec for sponsoring this week's episode of the Northern Miner Podcast. And thank you also to Stephen Stewart for making the time to share his views on what is happening. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us once again and supporting this show. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.